This is the Glasgow Mella, the annual gathering of Glasgow's British Asian community. Now, clearly, immigration into Britain from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, historically, is a comparatively modern phenomenon. We're talking two, maybe three generations. But the relationship between Britain and the Indian subcontinent is centuries old, and it's the roots of that relationship I want to explore now. We've mentioned briefly the West Indies, the Caribbean. Now I want to look at what Britons in the 18th century called the East Indies. This is another story where commerce, the desire to trade to make profit, was the driving force of the spread of British influence abroad, or at least that's how the story begins. I'm northeast of Glasgow now. I'm heading through a little place called Kinross, and I'm here on the trail of a nabob, one of those Brits that made his fortune in India in the early years of the British Empire. His name was George Graham, and he was the second son of an Edinburgh merchant. And the fact that he was a second son, I think, is historically interesting. Back then, it was always the eldest born that inherited the family estate, the family business. Second sons had to make their own way in the world. They were, they were natural adventurers. And Scotland, at least metaphorically, was a land of second sons. You see, in the century after the Union, it was the English who took all the best jobs in government, in law, so thousands of young Scots were forced abroad to seek their fortune, and Graham was one of them. He went first to Jamaica to try his luck on the plantations and failed, and then he tried India, where his fortunes changed quite radically, as you'll see in a second when I show you the house he bought on his return. This is it, Kinross House. It's absolutely stunning. The story of British involvement in India begins early in the 17th century, when the first English merchants set up trading posts, first in the southeast, then in Calcutta on the Bay of Bengal. They worked for a private company, the East India Company, licensed by the Crown to import tea, silk, spices, commodities much in demand in Britain in the 17th and 18th centuries. And for decades, the company traded with Indian merchants in peace, on an equal footing. Company men adopted local dress, some married Indian women. But as the years went by, the influence of the East India Company grew until by the mid 18th century, British merchants ruled most of India. I think it's fascinating, this question. How on earth was it possible for a private company to take over the best part of India? And there's a clue here in the story of George Graham. Graham didn't actually get rich trading with the locals. He made his fortune supplying uniforms to the East India Company's private army. And it's here that this story shifts. What once was a story of commerce becomes now a story of conquest. India in the 17th century was ruled by the powerful Mughal dynasty, but already this was an empire in decline. And as the influence of the Mughals receded, local princes fought for territory. And these squabbles threatened the interest of the merchants engaged in peaceful trade. And so the East India Company hired soldiers to keep the peace. With every dispute resolved, their influence grew, and a British Empire emerged in India as if by accident. Well, it's always described as an accident anyway. To be honest, my reading of the situation is that company men were perfectly happy to stoke up disputes if that justified their moving in and taking control. But the more important question is, what right did we have to play peacekeeper here? We weren't invited in. We moved in to protect the right of men like George Graham to get rich. And once again, we were playing a dangerous game, playing with people's lives for money. And in the mid-19th century, 
in a story I'll tell later, this dangerous game of empire building would blow up in the East India Company's face.